This week, we begin a series of six homilies leading up to the solemnity of Corpus Christi titled Living Stones. In these homilies, I'm going to set out my vision for our parish family. What is vision? The famous preacher described it as a picture of the future which produces passion in us. My passion, the thing that keeps me up at night, is this that our whole parish, every single person, becomes a family of disciples, passionately in love with Jesus and united in purpose to make him known. Over the next six weeks, you will all be challenged. My hope is that it will spark passion in you, so that in spite of those challenges, you may have the courage to join with me and put out into the deep. St. Peter says in his second reading, the Lord is the living stone. I have a particular relationship with stone. Stone set me on the path which puts me before you today. Last week I spoke to you about priesthood, about how it is through our weakness that the Lord's strength is revealed. And we heard Michael Barwick's tale of how he came to be training for the dancers and priesthood. It all sounded very nice. Up to two years ago, I had a nice story to tell, but not anymore. I think one of the things I've noticed, I've been pulled from the vocations promotion circuit. You know, as a young priest, you used to get lots of gigs, you know, telling the story of how you're a young priest and how joyful it is. I don't get called up anymore. So here's a bit of my real story. Our first memories usually kick in when we're about three years old. There's probably stuff that you can remember even now from that time just about be it playing with the dog, or maybe it was visiting mum in hospital with your dad to meet your new little brother or sister. My first memory is of watching and screaming as my father strangled my mother. It took the innocent child that I was and shaped the man I was to become. I was determined never to hurt anyone, to protect and to love. But I knew from that experience that emotions were dangerous that if you let them get out of control, they could hurt the people you love the most. Psychologists say that the first person a boy aspires to be is his father. He was what I aspired not to be, and yet the only lesson he provided in manhood was what I feared the most. When I was eight, I did my first Holy Communion and immediately wanted to be an altar server. Back then, there was no training. You just got shoved up there and learnt on the job, so count yourselves very lucky, guys. At that Mass, I watched the priests celebrating Mass intently, in front of hundreds of people. He was divided from his people by a big stone altar. He was helping them. He was giving them words of comfort and salvation. But he was also protected from them, and they were protected from him. He was doing all I wanted to do and seemingly had all the safeguards in place. For a child who had taught himself that emotion was weakness, that love is not something you allow yourself to enjoy in case it goes sour, that it's something you do with no reward incentive. For a child who inwardly thought that to meet the needs of others while suppressing his own needs in case they break out and do damage, for whom tears were a thing to be ashamed of, this stone altar, this cold heart slab, held all the answers. This stone would enable me to do some good in the world. On that day, I came down from the sanctuary, which to me seems like an interesting word now, and at the end of Mass said to my mum, I'm going to be a priest. I took all that fear and fragility and wrapped my heart of flesh in the safe casing of that stone. It gave me a foundation, stability, a sense of purpose and power. The compliments, they flowed in, praise for my choice, even if some of the adults maybe rolled their eyes, I was only eight years old, not aware of my certainty. Then praise for my maturity as I grew older, my poise, my calm, and my detachment in the face of crisis. They're all affirmations of this choice, feeding my ego and setting my character. It would be a little surprise that I chose the confirmation name Peter, the Rock. 
But perhaps that choice was prophetic, because look what happened to him. So let's fast forward to two years ago. 35 years old and full of self-sufficiency. And it was going really, really well. At least that's how it might have looked on the outside, to others and to myself. Though perhaps the more observant could see some of the cracks. I was youth chaplain for the whole diocese. It was very popular, down with the kids. I don't know if they think that now. A canon lawyer, so I knew the rules inside out. I worked at Apostolic Nunciature with an archbishop. And I'd just been married parish priest of one of the largest, geographically anyway, parishes in London. All after six years of priesthood, so not too bad. So what went wrong? Why, five months later, did I up and leave with such revulsion for the things of God? Well, some of it was my fault. A lot of it was my fault. But frankly, some of it was yours. Now, I'm not talking about you personally as individuals. I'm not going to go, it's your fault. It's a ring. It wasn't anyone's personal fault. But rather, it was the culture in the church of which we are all a part, you and I, which we passively help to perpetuate. It's the stone slab. By and large, the inner processes which attracted me to the priesthood are those within all of us which helped me to get there. I thought that by having a monopoly on holiness, I could help everyone to be holy, by taking on the burdens of all, but got me all those jobs and made me such a narcissist. But a complementary attitude among God's people ensures that very few priests ever wake up to the grace of God. It's the attitude which says something like this, holiness or religion is what Father does. As long as we come to Mass, as long as service is provided, I'm okay and he can do all the religion for me. But let's use an analogy to see how that works. If I go to the gym and do the exercise of 500 people on their behalf, uh, well, they all stay at home on the couch and eat crisps. What happens? One dead priest and 500 fatties. Spiritual death to meet the spo supposed spiritual needs of the host leads to 501 heart attacks. Or let's look at this problem from the other side. If in Father we see the model of holiness to which we must aspire, then if we do care about our church, which many of us do, the likely outcome is that we will see ministry mainly in terms of what we see him doing. Ministry in terms of power. That's why you get a clamour for women priests, or married priests, or all kinds of priests. Why does everyone think that you have to be a priest to be holy? Or a nun? It's because we've all been conditioned, you and I, to think that only with power will we be known, and only by being known can we be loved. What happens to communities where Father is absent? when he is not vigilant over a parish family. In this culture, it is taken over by a small caste of people who care, but who then adopt the same model they've learned from Father. High control, let no one in, think you are helping others by the very few approving voices that you are listening to. Even when Father comes back, he is excluded from participating because the community thinks it has the priest bit covered. Don't go changing anything, Father. An example of how blind we can be cropped up at our parish meeting last week. One person was speaking about how we welcome everyone in the parish. Another person said, but you've never spoken to me. To which the reply was something to the effect, well, you've only been here five minutes. We've been here for ages. The person then replied, I was baptised in this parish and have been here all my life, and you do not know me. They sat a few rows apart. I hope that you can begin to recognise yourself or yourselves in one of the above categories, or perhaps in both, because I certainly recognise myself in both. And acceptance is the first step to cure. Acknowledging your wounds is the first step to healing. We live and worship in a clericalist culture. 
and is defined by Pope Francis as this, as a sinful complicity. The priest clericalizes the layperson, and the layperson kindly asks to be clericalized. This is our stone slab, the slab that keeps us safe and certain, that teaches us what to expect and where to get it. But it encases a heart of flesh, which is tender, vulnerable, and in need of a saviour. We're going to smash it open. It's going to hurt, but it's going to set us free to feel the love of Jesus in a way we never imagined, to enable us to love him passionately in a way that still makes me tremble even to say it, to follow him wherever he takes us, and to desire to serve him in others with all our hearts, all our broken hearts. Now this is not my vision. This is Jesus' vision. He smashed open the stone slab of the tomb that was guarding my heart. And I was in so much pain that I thought my life was going to end. I felt I had no reason for being. Perhaps that's how you feel when I hint at church closure or a change of mass times. But through his infinite patience, his mercy and his love, his Holy Spirit filled my exposed heart of flesh with such a desire that even in all my weakness and vulnerability, I now feel like I can take on the whole world. Look at any two or three year olds, the terrible twos or the terrible threes, most parents can probably, they're nodding already. At this age, they're driving their parents crazy, but always watching and trying to save them from danger. But that three year old is so confident and free because he knows that he or she can run wherever they like because in the back of their mind, in a way they don't know how, they know that mummy or daddy will save me. They could not be more vulnerable, and yet they are the ones who are free and fearless because they know they are loved. If we journey together, this will become the daily reality for all of us in our faith and in our parish family. But then the question rises, it's always the question, but Father, how? How are we going to do this? Or maybe you're thinking, how are you going to do it, Father? Jesus must have rolled his eyes at this question. If you've got phones, uh, you know you've got those emojis. The, the newest emoji I like is the one where you're just, uh, looking up to the sky, the eye roll. We know that one. Jesus must have been rolling his eyes all the time in his apostles. Whenever he proposed something like, oh, show us the Father. How, how, how? In today's Gospel, for example, the moment after he had surprised his disciples by washing their feet, Jesus reassures them. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I shall return to take you, so that where I am, you may be too. You know the way to the place I am going. But then Thomas pipes up. Lord, we don't know the way. Now, picture the scene. Jesus, the way, is in the room. He's just said, you know the way I'm going. And the first thing Thomas says, we don't know the way. Do you remember when Jesus asked the apostles, who do people say the Son of Man is? He literally said, who do people say I, the Son of Man, is? So he gave them the answer in the question. And what do they do? Oh, well, some people say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist, some say Moses. He'd given them the answer and they still didn't understand. So in this instance, in today's Gospel, Jesus replies, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. And they don't understand. He says, no one can come to the Father except through me. And Philip asks, Lord, let us see the Father. To which Jesus rolls his eyes, maybe a bit heartbroken, and says, have I been with you so long, and yet you don't know me? To have seen me is to have seen the Father. And yet the next day, when he hangs on the cross, they run away, scratching their heads. The one thing we can conclude is that Jesus didn't choose his disciples for their brains, or their courage, or their talents. Jesus didn't choose his disciples to get things done or to fulfill a well-designed preset plan. He chose them because they were weak, exposed and vulnerable. 
By being broke, broken open, their failure on Good Friday, their fear on Holy Saturday, they were ready to be witnesses on Easter Sunday and to become missionaries at Pentecost when they would receive the Holy Spirit and go out onto the streets and proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. With Jesus, there is no how before we understand why we live this life. And we can't understand why until we do as the Apostle Peter instructs us in today's second reading. He says, set yourselves close to him so that you too, the holy priesthood, offers the spiritual sacrifices which Jesus Christ has made acceptable to God, may be living stones, making a spiritual house. If we set ourselves close to him, if we truly seek him, we should expect to be broken open, so that the stone which entombs us should become an altogether different thing. We can become a church not defined by the bricks under which we worship, but as living stones, building a spiritual house which cannot be contained and cannot be controlled, because it is free in the spirit. In this church, this family, we all exercise the priesthood of Christ, because Christ's priesthood was to offer his life for us in sacrifice. Jesus, the high priest, didn't just die for me, he died as me, to save me from a life of sin and a life of fear. He is my security. He takes away all my fear and makes me responsible for my brother and sister. Listen to these words of Peter, which I address directly to each one of you and all at the same time. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people set apart to sing the praises of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now when you hear that, does it fill you with desire? I hope so. When you hear it, do you feel it to be true in your own life? or in the life of the people around you with whom you worship each Sunday? I hope not, because if you did, for most of us, including myself, it would be a lie, because we have a lot of work to do together. Each one of you, each member of Christ's world priesthood, is invited to be a part of this work. We are no longer going to let structures, be they mass times, programs or events, dominate us. All is going to be built on the foundation of our mission. And our mission is this, to become a family of disciples, passionately in love with Jesus, united in purpose to make his love known. This will be our mantra, our way of life, the words which wake us up and keep us up at night, the words which fill our dreams and form the aspirations of our lives. There is one big heresy which we must never accept again in our parish family, and it's this. But Father, we've always done it this way. From now on, all we do will be determined by this one question. Does it serve our mission? We are a church of living stones. You are the living stones. And we build together, setting ourselves close to Jesus Christ. Now look at what happens when structure serves mission, rather than the other way around. In the first reading, two sections of the Christian community, the Hebrews and the Hellenists, they complain to the apostles. They feel that one is getting preferential treatment over the other. As your parish priest, in this parish, I know exactly what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that. So what do the apostles do? Rather than rush to keep everyone happy, they look at their own priorities first, which is proclaiming the word of God. But they don't neglect the need. Rather, they appoint and consecrate other ministers. They don't just go away and ordain more priests. They consecrate lay women and lay men from among the community to meet the needs of the community. And what happens? 
The word of God can reach more people, which multiplies disciples, which multiplies ministers, and Christ's presence is experienced in more people. They are living stones. Nobody ever complained in scripture about the times of celebration or whether it suited their convenience. Rather, people travelled from far and wide for it so they could receive power on high to minister to the needs of others. And the need is always the same. It is Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. If you think faith revolves around priesthood, then in one way you're right. Jesus is priesthood, and the one which you share in when you make sacrifices in his name for the good of others. So I hope I've set you up well for some of the changes that are going to occur here. I hope some of you are nervous, but also a little excited, because both fear and excitement are sources of adrenaline, sources of life. May our fear bring us into the arms of Jesus, and may our excitement push us out into the world to go and make disciples. Amen.